Thank you, Taylor. Tyler, what a wonderful song. When you're tried, you're going to be purified. That's what God does. God never tests you without a purpose. He doesn't put you through anything for which he has no purpose. Everything that we go through. Sometimes there's good news. Sometimes there's bad news. Let me read you about some good news and bad news. You ready? Let me give you this to get you set up. We're going to be in Mark chapter 14. But while you're turning there, let me tell you about some good news and bad, bad news. You know, sometimes preachers get good news and bad news. It's, it's a mixed bag. I mean, really, uh, it's a mixed bag. When you're, when you're a preacher, some days are good news and some days are bad news. Here's the what one about the good news. He said, the good news is that you baptized seven people today in the river. The bad news is you lost two of them in the swift current. <laughs> good news. The Women's Fellowship voted to send you a get-well card. The bad news, the vote passed by 31 to 30. Good news, you finally found a youth or a, a choir director who approaches things exactly the same way you do. Now the choir has mutinied. <laughs> the good news, Mrs. Jones, preacher, is wild about your sermons. But Mrs. Jones is also wild about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> Good news, your women's softball team finally won a game. The bad news is they beat your men's softball team. Good news, the trustees finally voted to add more church parking. The bad news, they're going to blacktop the front lawn of your parsonage. <laughs> Good news, church attendance ro rose, rose dramatically the last three weeks bad news was you were on vacation <laughs> good news the deacons want to send you to the holy land the bad news is they're stalling until the next war breaks out <laughs> that's the good news and the bad news so we're in mark uh, we're in mark chapter 14 we'll be in some other scriptures as well but uh, we've been been talking about uh, becoming a disciple and the lord uh, trained 12 men and these 12 men uh, were with him day and night, practically, uh, for three and a half years. And so they had the best teacher in the world. The Lord Jesus is the best discipleship teacher. And uh, in our last lesson, we were introduced to Peter. You remember that? Introduced to the Apostle Peter last time. And uh, he was in fishing with his brother Andrew. And uh, <coughs> they left their nets and their boats and became disciples of the Lord Jesus. Let's read Mark 14, 53. Now we'll look at a number of verses, so lick your thumb and get ready to turn some Bible pages. I like being a part of a church where the Bible is used, don't you? We want to know the Bible. I don't care what man thinks. don't care what the psychologists believe. don't care what the, or the psychiatrist thinks. I don't care what uh, the latest polls are in sociology. I want to know what God thinks and how to obey Him. Mark chapter 14, verse 53, we'll read this one verse and then we'll pray. Or, well, we'll read two verses. Mark 14, 53, and they led Jesus away to the high priest. And with him were assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. And Peter followed him, watch this, afar off, even un into the palace of the high priest. And he sat with the servants, now look at this, and warmed himself at the fire, at the fire, at the fire. We're talking about some campfires tonight, talking about two fires, Peter being in between two fires. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and see if we can learn something. Father, I pray that you'd bless us tonight, fill us with the Holy Ghost of God. I pray that you'd speak through us as we try to present the Word of God in such a way that it would be instrumental in changing our hearts and changing our lives and Lord I pray that you'd bless us to that end tonight Lord speak to us I pray and change us in Jesus name Amen now we see Peter tonight between two fires and I believe as we watch these disciples and see how Jesus trained them we can find out some things that would be good for us too don't you think so uh, the Lord is a great teacher and his disciples were under his tutelage, so we should be able to learn something that would help us. Do you ever get too old to be discipled? Never do, do we? Miss Hazel sitting over here shaking her head, never get too old. She has a hunger to want to know the Word of God. And uh, I appreciate people, you know, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. 
But I'll tell you something. I've been reading the Bible for a number of years now. I've been preaching for over 30 years. And uh, I'm learning more and more and more. And I told some of the kids in the Bible college class that I teach down at Jacksonville, I said, I learned some stuff in college that was very helpful while I was in Bible college. But I honestly believe that I've learned a whole lot more since I got out of Bible college because I had to do it when I was in there to get the grades. Now I do it because I love the Lord, I love His Word, and I want to be further instructed in the things of God. I want to be more like Him, and I can't be more like Him till I learn more about Him. Well, I want you to notice two fires tonight. Number one, the fire of regret. The fire of regret. The night before Jesus was crucified, he tells his disciples that he's going away. And then he institutes the Lord's Supper. After the supper and the eleven begin, he and the eleven begin walking towards the uh, Mount of Olives. And Jesus continued to teach them as they walked along the way. And uh, here's what he told them in Mark 14, 20, uh, verse 17 through 27. Now I'm going to read all of these verses here. So read along with me as I read out loud. You can read to yourself and let's look at this. Mark 14, 17, and he begins to tell them that they're going to be offended that night, not because of him, but as predicted, or well, it, it would actually be they'd be offended because of him, as was predicted in the Old Testament. Now watch this, Mark 14, 17. And in the evening he cometh with the twelve, and as they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, One of you which eateth with me shall betray me. And they began to be sorrowful, and say unto him, one by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? And he answered and said unto them, It is one of the twelve that dippeth with me in the dish. The Son of Man indeed goeth, as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good were it for that man if he had never been born. Now let me just stop there just for a minute and and look up here just for a second. Have you ever heard anybody say, well, I'm just not sure if, if Judas went to hell or not. Some say, well, it doesn't say. The, the, at one point, he, the Bible says that he repented himself and took the silver, the 30, uh, the 30 pieces of silver that he'd gotten from the chief priests, and he goes back and throws it down at the floor where they're seated and says that he's repented himself, and then he goes out and hangs himself. Well, some say, well, see, I believe that he may have gone to heaven. But no, he couldn't have gone to heaven, and here's why. Because the scripture says that it were good for that man if he had never been born. Now, if Judas had gone to heaven, that would be better than living here in the flesh, wouldn't it? If he had gone to heaven. But if he says it's better, it would have been better if he had never been born, that could only be said of somebody who went to hell, not somebody who went to heaven because heaven is going to be lots, lots better than here or hell. So, yes, I believe Judas did go to hell. Now, verse 22. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it and gave to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they drank all of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be, what's the next word? Offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be Scattered. Now the phrase offended, if you'll notice, we have the word offended underlined and I want to give you just a little definition of it. The word offended uh, comes from the Greek word skandalizo, which means to be knocked over, to stumble, or to fall away. Uh, somebody has said at some time in the past that offended means off-ended. Knocked off the top end, knocked over. And so... These disciples were predicted by Jesus to become offended or they're going to stumble on that very night. And uh, then Jesus quotes the prophet Zechariah where it says, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be 
scattered. Now, let me ask you a question. How does Peter respond to that? You've got your finger there in the Bible. How does Peter respond? Jesus says, all of you are going to be offended because of me this night. Now, what does Peter say? Well, Peter's response is, verse 29, but Peter said unto him, although all shall be offended, yet will not I. <laughs> well, Peter, Peter was humble, wasn't he? <laughs> Peter was humble and proud of it, you know. Peter was like the man who won an award for humility, but when he walked up to the platform to receive it, they took it away from him. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm afraid. Uh, well, he may be, Peter was certainly a proud person. He was not humble. He might have been like the guy that uh, said, he said, uh, you know, I, I wrote a book once on true humility and how I attained it. <laughs> Another guy said, said, I'm going to send you a copy of the book that I wrote. It's the ten most humble men in the world and how I trained the other nine. <laughs> you know, Peter wouldn't have won that award, would he? Peter was a proud person. And uh, we laugh at him, but sometimes we may act a little bit like Peter. I'm afraid none of Peter's other disciple friends would have voted him most humble in the group and I'm not so sure which one of them would have won it either but Jesus tells Peter he says now you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows twice this very night that's what the Lord tells Peter verse 30 and Jesus saith unto him verily I say unto thee that this day even this night before the cock, before the cock crow twice thou shalt deny me thrice or three times now, after such a warning from the Lord, you'd think Peter would have taken some steps to guard himself so he wouldn't become a stumbler, a failed disciple. But sometimes people don't listen very well, do they? Last night, I, I read the sad news today. I read the sad news today about an accident that happened at Ward last night. A man was walking on the railroad track at Ward. A uh, train coming down the track. The engineer said, uh, said he blew the horn. He saw the man walking down the track. He blew the horn. And when he blew the horn, the fellow, instead of stepping off of the train track, getting out of the way of the train, he just put his hands up to his ears and covered his ears and kept walking. Well, the engineer put on the brakes, but you know a train doesn't stop very quickly, and the man was killed. That reminds me of people who hear the warnings of the Word of God, and just like Peter that night, Peter heard the Lord's warning, but he didn't take heed. We need to take heed when the, the Lord gives us warnings. Peter should have remembered a truth found in Proverbs chapter 11 and verse number 2. When pride cometh, then cometh what? Shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. When we think of ourselves too highly, we think we're above stumbling. We think we're above failing. We think we have arrived at, Christ, at a Christian level where we're just a little bit above everybody else. Hello? Christians get that way. I said Christians do get that way. Sometimes Christians get to thinking, I've been saved long enough that I don't have to worry about committing those sins like those newer Christians do. I read my Bible enough that I know what God says and I don't have to worry. I don't have to worry about offending the Lord. I don't have to worry about stumbling. I don't have to worry about falling because I know what the Word of God says and, and I'm a strong Christian. The Bible says, take heed lest you fall. He that standeth, let him take heed lest he fall. Well, Peter didn't do that. When they arrive at Gethsemane, the garden. Jesus takes his inner circle of disciples, Peter, James, and John, and they go further into the garden, and then Jesus reveals to them the inner turmoil that's going on in his heart. He knows that his crucifixion is just around the corner. Verse 34, look at it. And Jesus is speaking here, And saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Now watch what Jesus tells them. Here they are, they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. They're down there at the bottom of the hill. Jesus is about to be crucified. And Jesus says, take heed now. 
And he says, tarry ye here and watch. What does it mean to watch? Jesus is about to go pray somewhere. He's going to step off over there a few steps away and get in a pray place all by himself, and he's going to pray. And he tells his disciples, he said, now you guys stay here and watch. They're supposed to be awake at the very least. <laughs> now, Peter's not acting much like a rock here. He, in fact, uh, Jesus calls Peter by his old name. Watch what he says in verse 37. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping and saith unto Simon Peter. And why is he singling out Simon Peter? Well, he's the kind of the leader of the group. Leaders come under more scrutiny than the followers. Now, all of us ought to follow the Lord. But leaders, in the book of James, it says, Be ye not many masters or teachers of the word, seeing they shall receive the greater condemnation. And so those who study the Word of God and teach the Word of God publicly better be careful because they will face a stiffer judgment. Now, look what he says. He says, And he cometh and findeth them sleeping, and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? He's calling him by his old name again, Simon. Why? Because he's not acting like that rock. Peter means a rock. Now he's not acting like a rock. <laughs> he might be acting like a rock head. But watch this. Then he says, Sleepest thou? Couldest not thou watch one hour? Now Jesus goes back to pray again. And he comes back and finds them sleeping the second time. Mark 14, 41. He comes back the third time. And he says, He come the third, cometh the third time and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Now what's the, let's stop here and make a little application. Are you with me? Everybody awake? Look, look up here just for a minute. Here's the application. When, when we are supposed to be watching, the Lord says, watch, pray. And one of the other gods, he says, watch and pray that you enter in, not into temptation. When we get a little bit drowsy in the Lord's work, when we become negligent and the Lord says, you ought to do this, you ought to be alert, and we just kind of drift along thinking, well, surely nothing would happen to me or we're not thinking at all. You ever go on autopilot in your life and you think, nothing's going to happen to me. I'm okay. Well, the Lord gives us an application here. It's those times when we get drowsy in the Lord's work, we get drowsy in our lives, we're not paying attention. It's those times when the, the devil slips in and throws a monkey wrench into the machinery of our life and messes things up for us. The temple guards come and arrest Jesus. And Peter follows at a distance. They're on their way. Uh, they're on their way and they're going through the courtyard of the palace of the high priest and, and uh, Peter enters the courtyard and he sits down near a campfire there and Jesus is taken on up to the upper level where they're questioning him and Peter warms himself. Are you ready? Listen to me. Peter warms himself at the fire of the enemy. He begins to hang out at the devil's fire. And friend, when we hang out at the devil's fire, we're headed for trouble. It won't be long. It won't be long. It won't be long till something's going to happen. So a servant girl there at the fire, they're, set, they're standing around the fire and Peter's warming himself. Man, it's a cold night and he's warming himself by the devil's fire. Can I just tell you that any time you go to the devil's fire, the immediate effect, well, you'll feel warm and cozy. Huh? The devil knows how to lure you. And so you go to the devil's fire, and he's warming. Old Peter's warming up there by the devil's fire, and the servant girl there, she said, Hey, I know you. You're, you're, uh, you, were with, you were with that man they're trying. You were with Jesus. I remember you. Peter said, No, no, you don't know what you're talking about, woman. Yeah. Watch out, Peter. Later, the servant girl sees Peter again, and she said, now I, I know you're one, of, you're one of his disciples. You're one of Jesus' disciples. Now watch this, beginning in verse 53. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes, and Peter followed him afar off. 
even into the palace of the high priest and sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. And the chief priests and all the council sought for a witness against Jesus to put him to death and found none. For many bear false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. And there arose certain and bear false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. And uh, I say, I've lost my place here. Let me go back. Here we are. Verse 58. And we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But neither so did their witness agree together. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it these witnesses, uh, th which these witness against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes and saith, What need we any of, of, of any further witnesses? Ye have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and, and to buffet him and to say unto him, Prophesy. And the servants did strike him with the palms of their hands and as Peter was beneath the palace, there cometh one of the maids of the high priest. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked upon him and said, And thou also wast with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied, saying, I know not, neither understand I what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch, and the cock crew. And the maid saw him again and began to say to them that stood by, This is one of them. Now Peter tries to fit into the group by the fire there and he participates in their conversation but Peter is a uh, where's Peter from he's from Galilee he speaks with a Galilean accent uh, these people are from Jerusalem and uh, they have a they've got a city accent <laughs> Peter was a country boy and he spoke with a country accent and uh, the word there is uh, lalia, which refers to the way a person speaks. And uh, being from Arkansas, I, I've numerous times had people to notice my southern accent. I, I haven't noticed it a lot myself, but I guess I've got one. <laughs> and I've had people to notice my southern accent and call attention to it. I, I was, uh, was in New York one time, and I was fueling up at a gas station. I, I went up to the window to pay the Hey, the lady at the cashier's box, and, and I was carrying on a little bit of a conversation with her. She said, where are you from? I said, I'm from right here in New York. I'm just joking with her. She said, you're not from New York. I'm from New York, and we don't talk that way. <laughs> uh, she could tell that I was from the South. And, uh, and when, you know, Peter was from, from Galilee. He had a country accent. He didn't grow up in the city. And by the way, Jesus was... Uh, spent most of his uh, years up in the area of Galilee too. So I've come to the conclusion that when we get to heaven, Jesus will probably show us how everybody should have talked. He'll probably speak with a country accent. Well, maybe not. <laughs> well, at this point, Peter denies the third time and, and the rooster crows. And uh, notice verse 71. But he began to curse and to swear. You ever notice when somebody when somebody's following the Lord afar off like Peter was, they begin to take on the characteristics of the crowd they're around. They think they think it's cool to cuss like the rest of them, tell the dirty jokes like the rest of them, blend in with the crowd. Well, he began to curse and to swear, saying, "I know not this man of whom you speak." And the second time the cock crew, and Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said unto him. Before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, he what? He wept. This is the fire of regret. Peter looks up 
at this point and sees the Lord. The Lord is up on upper level there at the priest's palace. The Lord's up there being tried. There's, there's hullabaloo going on all around him. And there's Peter down below on the lower level around the fire of regret, hanging out at the devil's fire. There's people everywhere. Can you imagine this in your mind? Here's a trial going on. Jesus is in the midst of all of the Sanhedrin and these guys that are accusing him, false accusations, and, and Jesus knows he's about to be crucified. He knows what's going to happen from beginning to end. And all of the turmoil that's going on around him, at the moment that rooster crows, Jesus looked down, I don't know how far, but it's a good long ways down, Jesus looked down and his eyes met the eyes of Peter and Peter remembered the Lord's prophecy before the rooster crows thrice thou wilt deny, or before the cock crow uh, twice you'll deny me thrice and Peter wept I can't imagine how it must have felt to him, but when he looked up and saw the eyes of Jesus in the midst of all that was going on, by the way, there's an application there for you and me too. In the midst of everything that's going on in our lives and of all the people, the seven billion people in the world, God knows everything that's going on. And when we think that we can hide out and do things that's disappointing to the Lord and maybe he won't notice it, he's watching. He sees every single one of us. Well, Peter should have remembered something, and he found out a truth here. In verse, uh, Proverbs 16, verse 18, the Bible says, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. You know how we might sum that up into a little principle? Never say never. <laughs> never say never. Never say it won't happen to me. I'm too good of a Christian to let that happen to me better be careful. Those are dangerous words. Now the rock, Peter, his name means rock. The rock has crumbled. He's failed the Lord. And he denied the Lord. He tried to act like he didn't know him. Even cussed a little bit. Just to try to convince the crowd that he didn't know the Lord. Now when he denied the Lord, well, let me, let me read John 12, 42 to you. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also, many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. That tells us something here. Why do people deny the Lord? Well, people today may deny the Lord for the same reason that, that these chief rulers who believed on Jesus, they tried to keep it secret. Remember some, the, the rich young ruler and remember uh, Nicodemus and... Remember some of these others like Joseph of Arimathea who later asked for the body of Jesus? You don't hear anything about them confessing their Christianity. Kind of try to keep it secret. Believers today can deny Jesus. We fail in our discipleship when we remain silent when we should speak up. Hello? Hello? Sometimes people won't speak up. Won't speak up. Won't speak up and let anybody know that they're a Christian at work because they're afraid they might not get that promotion on the job. Afraid to speak up and, uh, and say anything about being a Christian because they're afraid they might get put out of that circle of friends. So they deny the Lord by just being quiet, not saying anything. Some uh, don't speak up for the Lord because they don't want to be thought of as uncool or unpopular there's many ways to deny the Lord some deny the Lord when they get into a predicament that requires them to make a decision based on the, on the word of God there are times when we get ourselves into a place in life maybe we caused it, maybe we didn't but we get to an intersection in life and it requires a decision based on the word of God and somebody, maybe a trusted friend, a godly friend or maybe a pastor gives us advice and says, now here's the way you ought to handle that. To go this way would be sinful. To go this way would be scriptural. And then we have to make a decision. And if we make the wrong decision, if we decide not to follow the scriptural admonition, we deny the Lord. We deny his word. Isn't that true? 
there's been there's been times over the over the years that there's been church members who decided that they wanted to live together in immorality. You know that's that's a pretty popular thing today, just to live together and not get married. And uh, I, listen, there's nobody that's perfect, and everybody's made mistakes. Some have made that mistake. Some have made other mistakes. God forgives. And, uh, and when God forgives, he forgets. But it doesn't mean for us to keep committing the same sin. Quiet. <laughs> well, I believe that's true, don't you? <clears throat> I've, I've had people a number of times over the years, not a, not a great deal, but there's been times when we had to deal with it in our own church when, when uh, as a pastor, I would show them, look, now here's, here's what the Bible says about fornication. It's wrong. It's immoral. It's a sin against God. And uh, I would show them that and, and uh, show them the way that they ought to do. And look, either get married or one of you just move out of the house. Uh, it's, not a, it's not rocket science to take care of this. You know? And uh, sometimes they would say, well, I see what you're saying, but we love each other and we're going to go ahead and live together. And I'm saying, well, look, I, I'm just trying to tell you what the Scripture says. Scripture doesn't say that you have to forsake one another but you get married or one of you moves out of the house till you do get married yep then they put the church in the position where we have to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and the apostle Paul said when situations like that happen then their membership is to be revoked I didn't make that rule and sometimes the preacher or the church catches the brunt of the accusation and so they say well that's the preacher's fault he wouldn't he after all we've done for that church and then they want to do that well it's all the good things we do do, do not excuse our sin I I've done some good things I hope I've done a few good things in my life but if I decide to move out of my house away from my wife and and uh, shack up with some other woman, it wouldn't make any difference how many good things I've done. It wouldn't make any difference how many people I had won to Jesus Christ and kept out of hell. It still wouldn't make my sin, right? Hello? And so when we refuse to hear the instruction of the Lord, we end up in regret. And that's what we're talking about tonight, around the campfire of regret. Peter didn't listen to the Lord's warning. And he ended up in regret. Sometimes, you know, sometimes people, when people are trying to justify their, their sin, they can almost make humorous statements. If it wasn't such a serious thing, you'd, you'd actually laugh about it because they make up such crazy excuses. <laughs> I've, I've heard some of the craziest things in my life. Uh, had, uh, had one fellow one time that uh, got, mad, got mad at our church because we have some dress standards for leaders. And if somebody, if uh, a man's going to teach a Sunday school class, uh, we ask him to wear a a shirt and tie, and, and ladies wear dresses or skirts of, and uh, make them modest. And, and, uh, and so I had a fellow get mad at me one time and left the church because he said, I, he wasn't a teacher, but he just didn't like that rule. <laughs> he, he, didn't think, he didn't think the men ought to have to wear a necktie or a dress shirt and didn't think women ought to have to wear dresses to, to teach a Sunday school class. And so he left the church. Now, after he left, he... After he left, he ended up finding him a woman at the church that he moved to, and he got married, and she made him wear a tie and a shirt to every church service. <laughs> and he still is today. He wouldn't do it for the preacher, and he wouldn't do it for the Lord, but he did it for his sweetheart, you know? <laughs> well, it can be humorous. So Peter was at the fire of failure. Now let me quick, quickly take you to the fire of restoration. John chapter 21, verses 1 through 23, and we'll... Read verse 1 and 2. So, not knowing what to do after the crucifixion, Jesus has been buried, and uh, Peter, Andrew, and James, and John return to their former occupation of fishing on the Sea of Tiberias. That's the Roman name for the Sea of Galilee. And uh, chapter 21 of John, verse 1, it says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed him he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, and, uh, boy, that would be a good name to name your children. Ladies, you're always trying to think of something different to name those kids to make it sound unusual, unique. 
You want to name your children something? <laughs> or you suggest one for your grandchildren? Uh, tell them to name that boy Didymus. <laughs> sound, sound like a rock and roll singer from back in the 50s, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and their two other, uh, two other of his disciples. Now, fishing is usually good at night and the fish come up closer there in the Sea of Galilee at the nighttime, come up closer to the surface and they could usually gather up a good mess of fish with their nets and, and so they fished all night and they catch nothing and morning's coming and they're tired and hungry and they hear a voice, children, have you any meat? Calls from the shore and they say no. Then Jesus uh, tells them in verse number six, he said, cast the, uh, said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship and you shall find. They cast therefore and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. And so they catch so many fish they can't pull in the net. And uh, remembering that this had happened before, Peter knows that this is probably the Lord. In fact, John says to Peter in uh, Luke 5, 4, and 6, John says to Peter, it is the Lord. He knew that's the way the Lord does things. And so when they get to, well, Peter jumps in the water, and uh, he doesn't wait for the boat. He just jumps in the water, and, and I don't know if his feet was touching the bottom or if he was swimming, but he made his way to the Lord ahead of the boat. And... Uh, then Jesus has breakfast for them on the shore. Now, if Jesus cooked breakfast, that means he had a campfire. Fire. Peter walks up. Jesus says, I've got breakfast for you kids. Come on and eat. Yeah. They walk up to the campfire, and the last campfire Peter was hanging around was the fire of regret hanging around the devil's fire. This is where he denied the Lord. Now the Lord leads him right up to his own campfire. We call this the fire of restoration. And Jesus leads him up to that campfire. And don't you know that going through Peter's mind must have been that last campfire he was hanging out around. And he remembers being there and he remembers the eyes of the Lord coming down upon him when he denied him the first time. He failed. He failed at that first one. He's got regrets about it. He's probably thinking now, I can just imagine what the Lord thinks about me. The Lord knows everything, doesn't he? Well, as they finish eating, here Jesus use, uses Peter's original name again, Simon, instead of Peter, which means rock, because the rock has crumbled when he denied Jesus. And Jesus asked Peter if he loves him more. He said, lovest thou me more than these? Now, there's been a lot of discussion over what Jesus was talking about there. Some say, well, Jesus was looking at the nets. And do you love me, Peter, more than you love those fishing nets? Because you've gone back to fishing. Do you love me more than you love those nets? Or do you love me more than these disciples? Do you love me more than you love the disciples? Now, I think the true meaning there was Peter... You said you loved me before. That other campfire, Peter, you said you loved me. You said, remember, Peter, you said the other disciples might flee, but not me, yet will I not flee. <laughs> remember, Peter, remember in your pride and in your arrogance, and you said everybody will run, but I'll not deny you, Lord. You claimed, Peter, to love me more than the other disciples love me. Now, Peter, do you love me more than these love me? Do you love me more than the other disciples love me? Since you've fallen, since you've been offended, since you fell, do you still think you love me more than anybody else loves me, Peter? <laughs> kind of making him think, isn't he? John 21, 15. So when they had died, Jesus saith to, the, to Simon Peter, Simon, calling him Simon, his original name, not calling him Rock, not calling him Peter. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Jesus, when Jesus responds, Feed my lambs, he asked Peter again, Do you love me, Peter? And Peter said, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus says, Feed my sheep. Well, the lambs and the sheep are words of love and endearment 
And Jesus shows a love and a concern for the whole, plot, the whole flock, the lambs, the sheep, everybody. Aren't you glad Jesus loves everybody? <laughs> he loves the whole flock. And finally, Jesus asked Peter the third time, Peter, do you love me? And Peter was grieved, the Bible says in verse number 17, because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you love me? Why did he ask him three times? How many times back there at that other campfire? How many times did he deny the Lord? Three, wasn't it? Three times he denied the Lord. And Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? He's given him the opportunity to confess three times. We need to get everything right with God. When we go to the Lord and confess, we just need to do it all, don't we? Sometimes we try to confess our sins individually and then, or we try to commit our sins individually and confess them wholesale. <laughs> try to get it in all one sweeping motion. Well, Peter had denied him and the Lord knows all about Peter's life. He knows about Peter's heart. In 1 Samuel 6, 7, 16, 7, we learn a lesson that God knows how to look at the heart. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not thou on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For, the Lord, uh, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Now this is not teaching that the Lord doesn't care whether you go naked or dressed. He does. Uh, the Bible says that we're supposed to dress in such a way to honor him. The Bible talks about women dressing in modest apparel and so forth. And so some people use this to say the Lord doesn't care what you look like on the outside. God does care how you look on the outside. It's just that the outside can't make up for the inside. It's got to be right on the inside or the outside doesn't count for much. And so the lesson here is that the Lord knows how to look at our heart. We can clean up ourselves on the outside and we can be prideful and arrogant on the outside like Peter was and say, I'm a great Christian. I'd never deny you, Lord. But he did. And now the Lord sees Peter's heart and he sees that Peter's heart is repentant. When we come before the Lord, he needs to see a repentant heart. He needs to see a heart that has been touched and changed. And so Peter denies the Lord three times and the Lord restores him three times. Isn't that great? God doesn't quit forgiving when we just got to keep on confessing. <laughs> now he predicts Peter's death by telling him when he's old he'll stretch out his hands and someone will take him where he doesn't want to go. And tradition tells us that when Peter was old he certainly was taken by Roman guards to a place where he didn't want to go and that he was actually led to crucifixion and that he refused to be crucified in the same way that Jesus was. And tradition says that he asked if he could be crucified upside down so he wouldn't take any honor away from the crucifixion of Christ. Quite a different Peter than the one we saw back earlier at the other fire, wouldn't you say? Well, all of us can find hope in Peter's fire of restoration. No matter what we've done, the Lord wants us to come back, get around his campfire, confess humbly from the heart where we've failed, where we've been around the wrong fire, and come back to Jesus' fire. Now, what do we learn from this lesson in discipleship? Number one, everybody fails. Everybody fails. Peter the number one man in that little inner circle of Jesus' disciples. Jesus handpicked these men. Peter was the leader. He was the spokesman for the whole group. And he failed. He denied the Lord. I dare say that probably everybody sitting in this room has denied the Lord somehow, some way, somewhere along the line, including your preacher. We have failed. And failure is not final unless we decide to make it so. The Lord is always willing to invite us to the next campfire where he'll forgive us and make things right. And so we learn, number one, that everybody can fail. And number two, we learn that Jesus is mighty willing to forgive. 
Discipleship is to be a progression, growing closer to the Lord. And when we fail, we get back up, dust ourselves off, admit to the Lord what we've done, and then expect that he's going to forgive us. What does it say in 1 John 1, 9? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Aren't you glad about that? Discipleship keeps on going. Fall down, get back up. Should we fall on purpose? No. Peter, Peter made a boast there that he wasn't going to fall. We shouldn't plan to fail, but when we do, we ought to get back up, get back on track. Listen, I heard one preacher say it this way back years ago. He said, wherever you jumped the track, wherever you jumped the track, go back there and get back on the track and move on. Back on the track and move on. Let's pray. Father, I pray.